All right, listen, before we let you go, your seminal work is now in paperback, Donald Trump versus the United States. And there is new, there is new reporting in it. I must share with our viewing public this alarming detail about John Kelly, former chief of staff to the president, Trump, and his first day on the job. In the first several hours of his tenure, John Kelly learned of a rumor circulating in the West Wing. The beleaguered and soon-to-be former chief strategist to Trump, Steve Bannon, had installed some sort of listening device in the chief of staff's office. It was unclear where Bannon was or what he was up to, and there was a sense that Trump was preparing to fire him. Nevertheless, the possibility that he could be listening in on Kelly's first day was real. So throughout the day, as Kelly was familiarizing himself with the basics of West Wing and figuring out where the nearest men's room was, he whispered as he spoke with aides like Kirsten Nielsen when they were in his office. When Kelly wanted to speak in normal tones, he would step out onto the small patio just off his office. It was like something out of a bad spy movie. I mean, it's amazing that anyone went to work for this man. And yet, Steve Bannon, does he still remain in Trump's good graces? Yes. Amazingly. Yes, amazingly. And, you know, received a pardon from Trump and was part of January 6th. And, um, you know... And only, after only spending about six months in the White House. And bugging the chief of staff's office. It was office, a rumor apparently. that was going around that he had. And Kelly, who's looking, who's trying to get his feet underneath him and soon comes to realize that the biggest problem is North Korea, is dealing with, you know, rumors and frivolousness and fights between the First Lady and Ivanka and telling Omarosa that she can't have pool parties at the White <laughs> House and all while trying to stave off war with uh, North, North Korea. Korea. I mean, who among us hasn't had our office bugged on the first day of work and had to tell Omaro so she can't have full parties, you know? Michael Schmidt, Washington correspondent for The New York Times. Thanks for your time and great reporting. It's lovely to have you here, Michael. We reject this woke ideology. We will never surrender to the woke mob. Florida is where woke goes to die. A few minutes ago, we were talking about states that are newly controlled by Democrats and how their agendas differ starkly from the agendas in states controlled by Republicans. And I think it's safe to say that wherever the GOP states are going next, Florida will get there first. Fresh off his big second-term win, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is turbocharging his war on woke, in which woke seems to mean anything Ron DeSantis doesn't like. DeSantis goes after all kinds of things for being woke. College basketball, Ben and Jerry's ice cream, Disney, even math textbooks. And now he is slamming professional hockey. The NHL recently announced a push for more diversity in its ranks. Its workforce is over 80% white, and its players are over 90% white. But when they announced a jobs fair in Florida, DeSantis's office called it discrimination for the NHL to specifically invite applicants from underrepresented backgrounds the NHL folded and removed the job fair posting. So congratulations if you had keeping hockey white on your bingo card of Ron DeSantis' second term priorities. But it is Florida schools and university that its governor, universities that its governor is really trying to refashion in an anti-woke image. DeSantis has just packed the board of Florida's most progressive public college with hand-picked allies. He's aiming to turn new college into a conservative Christian school. These new board members include Chris Rufo, who's orchestrated the right-wing attack on critical race theory. And Rufo is straightforward about his goals. Quote, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. Meanwhile, professors at other Florida universities are canceling their courses dealing with race for fear of being fired. Today, the presidents of Florida's system of community and state colleges put out a joint statement declaring they stand with Governor DeSantis and won't let evil critical race theory invade their campuses. Also today, the State Board of Education finalized a rule that could see school librarians prosecuted for having undesirable books in their libraries. Undesirable to DeSantis and his allies. And in a final flourish, today we learned that DeSantis has rejected a high school advanced placement course in African American studies. The course is already being piloted in 60 schools across the country, but apparently in the state of Florida, that curriculum is against the law. 
The conservative National Review reported excitedly today on the letter the DeSantis administration sent to the College Board, which sets AP course curricula. That letter says, quote, the content of this course is inexplicably contrary to Florida law and significantly lacks educational value. And it invites the College Board to, quote, come back to the table with lawful, historically accurate content. All of this is bad enough for the people of Florida, but it may concern all of us outside of Florida if DeSantis really is on his way to a presidential run. Joining us now is Jelani Cobb, dean of the Columbia Journalism School and a staff writer at The New Yorker. Dean Cobb, Jelani, thanks so much for being with us. And I think there's really no better person to put in perspective how damaging this agenda is in terms of education and higher education. Can you give us your thoughts on the moves that the DeSantis administration is making to censor the teaching of history and race in this country? Sure. Uh, well, you know, there's, there's a very practical point to this. Like, they're trying to eradicate the history of the civil rights movement, the mass movement, among other things. Uh, weirdly enough, the civil rights movement is what made it possible for those universities to be so prominent in the first place. That the, the quiet uh, part of this narrative is that certainly black people uh, in the South benefited from the civil rights movement. Uh, the second biggest beneficiaries of the civil rights movement were the the Southern business class at its universities, uh, its, its chambers of commerce that were hoping to modernize the South, which was viewed as an economic and intellectual backwater by much of the country. Uh, and so in this march backward to make this heavy-handed uh, diktat about what can be taught and what can't be taught, you're literally pushing these institutions back into the past. So good luck with attracting world-class faculty and keeping them there. Uh, good luck with attracting uh, the top students. Uh, good luck with uh, maintaining the rankings that, that make these universities in the South uh, competitive in the first place. It, this is a kind of rearguard march. Uh, with maybe the people who are in those crowds uh, cheering, uh, but none of those people are going to be, uh, you know, responsible for what happens when their universities start cratering, it, cratering uh, in terms of their prestige and, and the regard in which people view them. I just wonder if this isn't, I mean, it seems, at least from the support that DeSantis receives in certain corners, it's part of this obsession with turning back the clock, as you said, not just in the civil rights era, but the, the sort of the intellectual flourishing of ideas that happened in higher, institu <laughs> higher institutes of higher education in the 60s and 70s, and the sort of, you know, bringing a more inclusive, progressive view to the ways in which we understand both, you know, the canon and history and a number of other things. And, and, and the right seems to be very preoccupied with that. It's like they lost the culture war writ large, so they're going to wage it in the halls of education. And my concern is there are Republicans all over the country that look at what Ron DeSantis is doing and say, hey, I want to do that in my, in my backyard. I want to do that in my state. I want to bring that kind of curricula to Wisconsin or other parts of the country where there is, you know, or Virginia, where you have Glenn Youngkin, the governor, who's expressed support for this kind of stuff. I mean, does that concern you? Apart from what it does to the university system, what about the general public in these states? Sure. I mean, it, it has negative implications all over the place. Uh, and uh, one of the, the bizarre ironies of this situation is that uh, when Ron DeSantis, uh, in, in uh, denouncing the AP course, uh, you know, he used the language of saying that this was discriminatory, that studying these subjects would be discriminatory, and implicitly discriminatory against white people. Uh, the weird thing about that, the really, really weird thing about that is that People who are scholars of critical race theory will tell you that the theory basically holds that uh, in, in a society that is as uh, racially riven uh, as this one, people will use anti-discrimination tactics in order to further the cause of actual discrimination. So in short, Ron DeSantis is practicing critical race theory and doing exactly this. Uh, he's validating the theory uh, in these actions. Uh, and so, uh, but the implications of this are all over the place. And, and the last thing that I think that's really important to, to note is that the kind of protections that we have and the academic freedoms that we have in this country are overwhelmingly a product of what happened during the Cold War and the McCarthy era. Uh, another point in which we saw heavy-handed attempts to try to dictate 
uh, what people could and could not learn, uh, people being prosecuted, people losing their jobs uh, for, for teaching uh, facts that were uh, accurate but uncomfortable. Uh, and so we're, we're yet again uh, having a march backward in the pages of history. I, I wonder if you look at this, you know, sort of holistically in terms of the Supreme Court taking up affirmative action and this movement we now see that suggests that efforts to diversify bodies, whether they're school bodies, whether they're corporate boardrooms, whether they're the NHL, are fundamentally anti-white and that they are di reverse discrimination. That seems, that, that theory, while fringe, now seems to be more widely accepted that at any time since I have been alive. Is there any way to turn sure. back the wheel to get back to sanity as far as what, you know, what we're talking about when we're actually talking about diversity? Sure. Uh, I mean, so when you, you know, cited those numbers, we, the NHL, NHL's workforce being 84 percent white, uh, its players being 90 percent white, and then you look at the fact that whites are about 60 percent or 61 percent of the American population, you say, oh, well, there's a disproportionate representation there, or rather, a underrepresentation of other groups. So to frame the efforts to diversify as discriminatory are, in effect, saying that you want to uphold the kind of discrimination that has already resulted uh, in people being so poorly represented uh, uh, in that one uh, area, the lots of other areas of, of American employment uh, and universities and so on that we can find those same sorts of statistics about. Uh, and so I think that's what's really at the heart here, to, to try to frame a upholding of the status quo and, and really validation uh, of the worst sins of the past uh, and try to frame it as an actual kind of civic virtue. Validation of the worst sins of the past. That is what a is actually happening here. I think it's really important to make that the headline rather than we're pushing back against some Marxist liberal ideology that's trying to brainwash everyone's children. Jelani Cobb, Dean of the Columbia Journalism School and staff writer at The New Yorker. It's such an honor and pleasure to have you with us, Jelani. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Joining us now are Democrats Winnie Brinks, who is the Michigan Senate Majority Leader, and Melissa Hortman, Speaker of the Minnesota House. Thank you, ladies, for being here tonight. It is good to have you with us. There is, at least on one side of the aisle, a lot of excitement about what's happening at the state level. Um, and I will start with you, Winnie. How should, how should you know, the voters of your state set their expectations in terms of what's going to get passed and how fast it's going to get passed? Yeah, I think you heard in your introduction um, how important state legislatures are. So we are incredibly excited about um, the aggressive agenda that we are going to pursue. Um, you mentioned some of those things. We will also add uh, expanding civil rights for LGBTQ folks, uh, defending abortion rights here in the state of Michigan. Uh, and so we're, we're ready to get to work uh, very quickly. Uh, we have committed to be very thoughtful and very deliberate about pursuing our agenda, but we have a lot to do. Yeah. Well, Melissa, in terms of that, the speed with which you can act on this stuff, I mean, Scott Walker, who was interviewed about this trifecta, is not a fan of the fact that Democrats hold this much power at the state level, but he did concede that effectively the most significant accomplishments come at the beginning of the legislature coming into power. I wonder if you agree with that and whether you think we're going to see a flurry of activity at these, in these Democratic trifectas in the coming months rather than the coming years. Yeah, I think you'll see a lot of similar work across those uh, four M states that you talked about. I, you know, Democrats are really united in our values and our priorities. And what's wonderful here in Minnesota is to finally have a Minnesota Senate that's also controlled by Democrats. For the last four years here in the House, we've been passing things like gun safety regulation and uh, paid family medical leave. Uh, we've been a pro-choice majority, but now we have a pro-choice majority in the Minnesota Senate, and so we can finally take action and put those bills on the governor's desk. Does it worry you, Winnie, um, that when, when, when states become, well, actually, let me, let, me, let me ask you a slightly different question. The idea that states are the sort of laboratories for democracy is, or just laboratories, if not for democracy, is something that's been road tested by Republicans who've had a, a, a number of these trifecta and, have, and their trifectas have outnumbered the Democrats for the, in recent years. Are Democrats prepared to be as aggressive in terms of the laboratory aspect of, of these state legislatures as Republicans have been in years past? And is that a political risk at all? 
I think here in Michigan, we are really ready to take on that challenge. We've got 40 years of pent up policy ideas uh, in, here in the Senate, uh, and the Democrats are ready to take that on. Uh, I think uh, we do have a narrow majority, so we will be thoughtful. We will be looking for some bipartisan cooperation on certain things, and I think that we can get there with some folks. Um, our constituents are really tired of the chaos and the corruption and uh, the conspiracy theories that you have seen far too often coming out of the out of Michigan in the news. And so uh, we're really ready to get to down to the fundamentals. So I think our legislature is ready to do that. And I think our constituents are really hungry to see that from us. So I don't okay. think the political risk is uh, uh, going to be a big problem. Do you think, let me just ask you a follow on that. How are Republicans in the state houses reacting? Are they, I mean, I know that I, certain, certain Republicans have been quoted as saying, man, it was like a bucket of cold water effectively when Democrats took these trifectas. Do they seem prepared to work across the aisle? Do they see what's happening in Washington and say, hey, that looks like a good idea, pursuing conspiracy theories about Italian satellites? Or do they actually want to get real work done? I think that the Republicans clearly in Michigan are incredibly divided. We will be able to find folks who are uh, interested in doing good things for the constituents that they represent. I'm confident in that. Uh, it may be tough for them at times, but I do think there are people there that we can extend a hand to and do some uh, good policy together with them. Uh, time will tell, of course, if I'm right, uh, but we are ready to get to work and give that a try. I've been in the minority for 10 years in the legislature. I know how they feel. Uh, and I was always really working on finding things that I could do for the people in my district, and I hope that they will too. Do you feel, do you guys, I'll ask you both this, do you feel like the clock is ticking, or are you confident that the measures you will enact will be so broadly popular that your power could be cemented for years to come? Winnie, you go first. Well, I would just say that, you know, we have two years. Here in the Minnesota House, we will be up for election in 2024. And the one thing I know about being on the ballot is there's always a surprise in the election. People never get the results that they expect. From Minnesota electing Jesse Ventura governor in 1998 to Democrats doing surprisingly well in a midterm election in 2022. We only know we have these two years, so we are going to make every minute worth it. And I loved hearing Winnie talk about, you know, that they're really ready to go in Michigan. We've been saying hashtag LFG, and our PG version of that is we are really ready to go. I think I think our viewers know what hashtag LFG means um, <laughs> and applaud the 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 audacity of that hashtag. There is something called a trifecta in U.S. government. Those are states where Democrats hold both chambers of the legislature and the governor's mansion. States where Democrats won't need to negotiate with people who want to abolish the IRS or hunt down Italian satellites. In total, there are now 17 states with Democratic trifectas. That's up from just six in 2017. But the states worth really focusing on here are the four states where Democrats just won their trifecta this year. They are all M states, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, and Maryland. Republicans held at least one piece of the governing trifecta in each of these states for years. But now, with the swearing in of Governor Wes Moore, all of the state legislators and governors for those states have been sworn in and those Democratic trifectas are complete. And now Democrats in those states can really get to work. In Maryland, Governor Moore and the legislature have already laid out their top priorities, increasing the minimum wage to $15 an hour, codifying the right to an abortion, and gun safety regulation. Not a peep, by the way, about Italian satellites. Legislators in Massachusetts are already planning to file at least two dozen gun safety bills as early as this week. In Michigan, Democratic legislators have introduced bills to repeal the state's anti-union right-to-work law, to repeal the state's zombie abortion ban from 1931, and to expand civil rights protections to include sexual orientation and gender identity. In Minnesota, Democratic legislators are working on legislation to protect the right to abortion, to legalize marijuana, to allow undocumented immigrants to get driver's license, and to require Minnesota utilities to move to 100 percent clean electricity by the year 2040. I know, we all know, things in Washington are a circus right now. And for the moment, that is all they are. The state level is where the real governing is really happening. Democrats have two years in power, at least. So what can they get done?